Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles, your favorite true crime podcast. I am Donnie, and with me is a man that says a candy necklace after the age of 50 is just a string of tums. It's Dale. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, got to have them tums, man. Yeah, probably had a ball of them on the cruise this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've been out of the country. Yeah, man, we had a blast. Good, Big good. Family vacation we hadn't been in years and years, and the four of us went on a cruise. And nobody went missing. Nobody went missing. That's I kept, good. I kept an eye out. Yeah. <laughs> Keep an eye out. Not, li- not literally. I can't take them out, but you know what I mean. You sleep with one eye open? <laughs> Negative. I'm <laughs> sleeping. I'm real sleeping. <laughs> but we had a blast. It was a great time. Good deal. I'm glad the family get, had a good time and everybody's safe and got back home safe. Yeah, got back yesterday and wore out. Yep. Yep. That's why we're recording today. That's right. <laughs> yeah, getting her done. Getting her done. For our fans because we love every one of y'all. We do. Yep. And before we get going on this episode, dude, I want to... Push our store page, get you something cool to wear, yeah. get you a t-shirt, get you a hoodie, get you something. Whatever some, you need. Yeah. Stickers. Yeah, something. <laughs> they help keep the lights on, it helps pay the bills, and keeps putting out these episodes for you guys. That's right. We mm-hmm. appreciate every bit. Yep. And if you want a good Apple podcast and leave a rate and review, you can do that. Write something in the box, and it will show up, and we'll give you a big old shout out. Yes, we will. Mm-hmm. Seeing how we don't have one this week, there is no shout out. No, we hadn't had an Apple I, podcast. I'm over here lonely. <laughs> we hadn't had one in a, in a couple of episodes, so That's right. people need to get over and do that. Because I know Apple is our, our biggest podcast we're downloaded on. Yeah. And people need to do that. They need to go over and click it and write something in the box. Yeah. Yep. All right, man. But other than that, we're going to get going this episode, dude, because yeah. we, we got an interview we're going to do. It's going to be a good one. You know, last week we interviewed Heather Terrell. Yes. She was from Mississippi, and she was abducted when she was 11 years old. Right. And she had a hell of a story, man. Yes, very much so. And she brought up in her story about her seeing two kids in the back of that car that she was abducted in. Yes. One being Asia Degree that we've covered on our show many times, and another kid that we have never heard of before. Right. Which is sad. His name is David Crabtree. Right. Well, at least she thinks that's it. That's who she thinks it is. Yeah. And we wanted to know more about David Crabtree. Because there's nothing. No. You can't find anything on this kid. No. No. No information at all. And I got to looking into it, and I reached out to the David Crabtree Facebook page. And I got a hold of the the lady there that runs that page. Okay. Her name is Shannon Cavender, and she has taken up speaking for David Crabtree. Great. She is taking upon herself to. Get, need, he needs a great advocate. Yes, she's doing this to get the word out on him, trying to find out what happened to him, where he's at, and where do we need to go. All righty. But I did reach out to Shannon, and she was graciously kind enough to agree to an interview. So we've got her on the show. So Shannon, welcome to the show. Hello. Hey, how are you today? I'm doing all right. How good. are you? We're good. But before we get into it, uh, just tell us a little about uh, about you and how you got into uh, speaking for David Crabtree. Um, yes. Back in December of 2014, I married into the Crabtree family. Um, I married David's older sub- or the oldest sibling of David, his brother James Crabtree Jr. Um, and then as we Um, progressed in our relationship. Um, I learned that James had had a brother um, who had been missing um, for several years. And um, from there, it kind of took off. And I have a criminal justice background. Um, I do have a master's. I'm almost done with my PhD. Um, Not quite. But so... Um, I was able to gather a lot of information and use some of my resources to uncover as much information as I possibly could and then to try to get that information out to the public as best as I could and using social media to help progress the case. Okay. So what were your thoughts on David Crabtree, when you first heard your husband, who's your ex-husband now, talk about him missing, what were your first thoughts on it? Um, that it was a very sad situation that um, literally no information, no updates, nothing had occurred 
um, at that time it had been 14 years. Mm -hmm. And um, so I thought, well, let me, you know, use what I know and what resources I have available to try to help um, not only James, you know, find out any information that he could, but to help the Crabtree family and everyone that, you know, the family that was impacted by him going missing. Okay. So tell us some stuff about David as a younger child that you are aware of, that you know of. Yes. And um, again, I was not um, a part of the family when he was a child, uh -huh. but James always, you know, spoke of him. You know, he loved to play sports. He did wrestle. Um, he was on the wrestling team. He did wrestling outside of school. Um, he really was just a pretty normal, happy-go-lucky kiddo until around the year that he disappeared. Um, that school year had become pretty tough for him, and he had gotten into some trouble at school and was placed into the alternative-type setting that was in the town of Locust Grove, um, where they resided when he went missing. Um, but again, he loved to, you know, be outdoors and to just be with James because James was older than him. So he always wanted to try to, you know, go with him places and do what James was doing. Okay. But according to his Charlie Project page, he had ran away from home on April the 5th of 2000. What was up with that? Um, well, he also had, it, it had become an ongoing thing that he was just not wanting to, you know, attend school, started hanging out with some of the kiddos that were at this alternative school that may have not been a very positive influence. And they, you know, had names for themselves. And so um, David just decided he, you know, wanted to enjoy his life at, as a teenager and would just, you know, not necessarily go missing, but run away, you know, sneak out the window or not come home when he was supposed to. And so at that particular time, um, he was arrested by police in Pryor, Oklahoma and brought into the Pryor Police Department. Well, James recalled this evening very well because he was one of the individuals, him and his mother, that actually went to the prior police department to pick up David um, that in the middle of the night. Um, the prior police department thought that David was older than he was because he, you know, was maturing in the face to where he had some facial hair and he just appeared older than he was. Well, he was a once, big kid too, right? Yes. And so once they determined that he was not an adult, you know, of course they were like, okay, yeah, we need to contact the parent. And so that evening, or, you know, in the middle of the night, um, Brenda and Brenda Miller, his mom, and James Crabtree Jr. went and picked up David from the Pryor Police Department in Pryor, Oklahoma. And this is where some information is a bit skewed. Um, my um, ex-husband recalls the story a bit differently once they left the Pryor Police Department um, than his mother. Um, there is a town, Claremore, Oklahoma. I'd say it's about 45, maybe an hour, just depending upon how you drive, um, from prior from prior Oklahoma to Claremore, Oklahoma. And this is where there was a home for, you know, troubled youth. And so they immediately took David there. Well, David was under the influence because when he had gotten arrested, um, he had been drinking with, you know, whoever he was with. There was two other individuals, um, one being older, and then um, one was a kiddo that was from the alternative school. Well, when they arrived in Claremore, Oklahoma, in the middle of the night, um, Claremore, this um, specific 
boys home or group home was like this is a liability we cannot take him under the influence so the way James remembers it is they left that night and they went home well Brenda recalls it differently saying that she left um, David there and so again the verification on whether or not he actually stayed is kind of up in the air. But James, you know, he remembers. He recalls that on the way home, which from Claremore to Locust Grove, it's a little bit further of a distance, probably close to an hour and 15 minutes, hour, again, hour and 20-ish, depending upon the route you take. But James remembers that David needed to use the bathroom, so they pulled over on the side of the road. Um, and, you know, David went out and did what he needed to do, and that they went on home. And so, again, on that piece of it, that is the best that I can supply concerning whether or not he actually was admitted to the boys' home. Hmm. Um, Again, mom remembers it differently than the brother. And at that time, James was 19. Okay. And so, you know, he he was of age to at least remember, you know. So, unfortunately, I don't have any cold, hard proof as to whether or not he even stayed the night. But either either way... He didn't stay long if he if he was actually admitted to the group home in Claremore. Not to get any help or anything, right? Yeah, there wasn't enough time that uh, you know elapsed between that time and the time that he went missing. Okay. Hmm. So he came home. What happened after that? It was just a few days that he ran away again. Yes. And, and so um, you know they tried to do the best that they could to discipline, um, you know, David and, you know, you can't go out, you have to stay home, you're pretty much grounded to the house. Okay. Well, on the night that um, he snuck out the window, he expressed to his family early, because James remembers, that he thought it was rather odd that David was saying, I'm going to bed. And... He let his family know, hey, I'm going to my room, I'm going to bed, like, that's it. Well, you know, James says some time went by and he can't remember what exactly he wanted to tell David, but that he went to his bedroom door and um, something that David um, did whenever he would sneak out, he was able to barricade um, the door from being opened by using his closet door so that I guess the way I see it in my mind is it would catch and then you can't enter into the room and yeah. so um, you know James Knox he says hey hey you know trying to talk to him he's not there so James goes to his parents room he says that he knocked on the door and you know announced himself and you know they they're very they're, they're native so they prefer things the way that they are and by all means um you know respectfully so he announces himself he goes into his parents room he tells them david's gone and they're like well you know nothing new like he's this is a regular for him and so they weren't really concerned because, again, this had been ongoing for quite some time. And so James says, well, I'm going to go outside. You know, I'm going to go look for him. And, again, he doesn't remember what he wanted to even say to him or, you know. But so he goes outside. He's able to see um, through the apartment window that, yeah, the window are, he's able to see that the door is barricaded through the window and he sees, obviously, the windows open. And so he says that he wandered around the apartment complex um, just hollering for him. And then there was a path that was used by, you know, several people. It's just a regular path that led out to the road from the apartment complex through 
a small section of woods, not a very large section, but, you know, enough that he went on this path and he thought, well, I'll just go looking for him, you know. And so, mind you, it's spring, and so it gets dark later. And so he said he wandered around, you know, talking to um, an older woman who lived at the end of this particular path, like her house set off to the side, and she was outside, and James, you know, said, hey, have you seen, you know, my brother? Um, because, again, these it's a very small town, and so people just, you know, they would see those kinds of things. Well, let, me, so, let me ask you this. What, yeah. day, what day was this that he went missing on this one that James went looking for him? What day was this? Um, this is April 8th, but because it is so late in, you know, like almost to midnight, um, that's when he didn't come back that next day. That's why it's reported that it's the 9th. Okay, so we've, had a, we've had a lot of people comment on our socials about this. You know, because it states everywhere that he went missing on the ninth, but in actuality, he left on the eighth. I think it was he left on the eighth, and it actually was reported on the ninth as well. That was yes. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. And we just wanted to clear that part up. Yeah. Yes. And again, um, the information that was provided, all of this, um, has the mother and James and his siblings, because he does. There's twin sisters also. Um, you know, kind of go back and forth on exact times and things like that. But again, it being so long ago, um, you know, that's that's completely possible. But the report is for the ninth. Okay. And so it only makes sense that it's the eighth in the evening, you know, mind you again, springtime, so, you know, daylight savings time. My guess is if it wasn't dark yet, then we're talking eight-ish, you know, getting close to nine. You know, the sun's starting to go down at that time, maybe, you know, yeah. around there. Um, and so he did. James did not have any luck, um, so he returned back to the apartment. Well, the next day, being the ninth, is when the family's, you know, okay, well, where is he at? Like, what's, you know, he didn't come home. Um, so, again, they go looking um, in places that he's known to frequent. Um, there was, like, a pool-type hall um, down the street. And so James remembers going, you know, riding with the mom and um, talking to people and just going to all these locations that they hoped to find David. And they never did. Mm. And so... The report, again, is for that day. And after that, there's a lot of uncertainty on what occurred after the fact on the family's part. When I came into the picture in 2014, he had not been ever listed as a missing or as anything on any of the children's databases, on any national missing sites for people in general, there was literally nothing. It was as if he just vanished and no one even ever followed up. How did the police department or the county sheriff's office have him listed? Is a runaway or? How yes, yes. And my understanding because I have brought that you know had brought that up um, over the years that I was married to James for seven years I said well what what did they do and at that time um, I guess because you know it was early 2000 that some of these databases didn't exist at that time and because once the report was made the Locust Grove, uh, you know, police department says it was never, no one ever came back to discuss anything. It was never discussed or brought up again. So it just remained as a runaway. And because no one ever brought it up again, it just went forgotten. What the hell? And yeah. 
And so that, you know, again, that was something that I was able to actually see in, in 2014 that that didn't make any sense. Okay. And I so I knew I had to, to do something. So on this April the 8th, the evening that he snuck out of his bedroom window, you had told me earlier and we had talked earlier in the week that his sister was standing outside and saw him leave. Yes. And this was reported by the sister only in the last um, few years. So um, James, clearly he didn't see the sister, like, you know, see that happen. But James was told that one of his sisters, um, again, they're twins, and one of the sisters is named Cynthia, and she was in the parking lot. And she was 16 at the time and, you know, hanging out, doing whatever she's doing. And she actually witnessed him going out the window. But being that she's, you know, a teenager herself, this is the typical of her brother, she wasn't alarmed. And, again, she never... If she saw if he left or any of that, she's never said. But other than she saw him go out the window, and that's it. And so, again, she was probably, you know, doing what you do as a, as a kid, you know, pay, not paying attention to that. And where he went from there is, is the question. Did she happen to mention that he met anybody outside? Did she see anybody else standing out there waiting on him? Or, or did he just leave on his own? And that's where I, I'm not certain on that, but based on what James has spoken of it, that she just literally seen him go out the window and then go on his way. Like she didn't witness anything out of you know the ordinary or someone there to pick him up um, because I mean she was in the parking lot and so this particular um, apartment complex is it's more like duplex type <laughs> it's not like high-rise or anything this is a very small um, I would say probably less than 50 maybe not even that many apartments um, on its Johnny Chopper Drive mm -hmm. in Locust Grove. And so had there been a vehicle, had there been other stuff, I would assume she would have seen, you know, a vehicle or him leave in a vehicle. And she would have been able to provide that information. Um, now, you know, maybe she has. And, and I'm just not aware. Um, and again... All I know is that she did state, and it took her, for some reason, I, I'm not sure why, but it took her several years, like hmm. 20 years, to wow. to say that she actually witnessed him going out the window. What the heck? And, you know, I, I don't know why she chose to, to not provide that or any additional information for all those years. That's just crazy. Yeah. Wow. So you said that uh, when he was in, I think um, there was a younger guy and an older guy that he was hanging around with. Have, yep. Have, that's, the, have they been? Have they been identified or have they been talked to or anything? Um, they have been identified. Um, I was able to access the police report from that evening. Um, again, that was something that was a bit of a concern for Brenda as to how this information became available to myself. Um, and again, I let her know in Oklahoma, records are, they're public. You just have to know what to access, where to access, and based on, you know, what approximate day it is, all you have to do is go look on there and see who was, you know, arrested on that night. Um, and so the, they were brothers, the um, two that he was with, and the older one was 19, and the other one, I believe he was 14. Um, and they have both been identified 
I did reach out to both of them myself. Um, I would say 2018, 19, when this all started. And again, I have like exact dates and have kept record of all of this because I always thought, hey, there may be a missing piece here that I help, you know, get this information to the right people. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I did reach out um, to the one that was closer in age, the younger one. Um, the 19-year-old actually went on to live a life of crime, um, including murder, um, and is still in jail at this particular time. Um, I even reached out to the mother, um, who literally was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know this kid. I've never seen this kid. Um, but the sibling who was the, the younger one, um, he remembered David. He remembered. And all he said to me um, via, you know, Facebook going back and forth was that, yeah, they had been friends. They met at the alternative. Um, that that night they went out, they were drinking, obviously they shouldn't have been, um, and he, they got in trouble, and he knew that, um, you know, because they were all brought into the prior police department together, um, and after that, he thought that David moved. He was told by, I guess, other kids um, at the alternative school where they were attending, um, he just wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that's all that that particular um, individual was able to say and that he never knew where he went and that was the end of it. That is insane. Wow. So what yes. what transpired after he went missing and the report was filed on April the 9th of 2000? What did the – that you know of that the – authorities say after that what did they say that they were looking into from pretty much the information that has been provided to me via james and the hearing brenda the police didn't do anything they literally did nothing because he was so known for running away or you know going out and doing whatever but always returning and the fact that the family never came back and was like, help, he's not still not home. They didn't do anything. Hmm. That literally they dropped the ball, they it, it just stayed that way as a, you know, run away and literally was forgotten. Man. So it sounds like nobody done anything till you came along. Or am I just missing something? Yes. Yes. Wow. Um, I I was told by Brenda herself who, um, you know, I'll be honest, she liked me for about five seconds um, of those years. Um, but once I started, as she would say, putting my nose into her business, into her family's business, and trying to bring light to the situation, she was not happy. Well, there's a kid missing. Yeah, her kid. And, and well, so, well. for me, I know I have my own children. I know that I work with kids. That's just what I've done for the entire, you know, career that I've had since all of my years. I knew he needed a voice. I knew that he wasn't listed absolutely anywhere. I was also told that it was reported to the paper. Well, in um, Tahlequah, which is a town that's close by, and the prior, you know, paper, um, they searched. They searched for records. I was able to um, speak to them. They were really kind. I mean, it was, they couldn't find anything. And so... I thought, well, why so many, you know, discrepancies? And again, so much time has passed that I try to, you know, err on the side of caution that things are forgotten, that, you know, she may have thought she did these things or, you know, that this was just a process, like when she reported him as a runaway, that they would follow up 
or that they would enter him into all these databases. I mean, I, I can't really speak for her on, on that piece of it as to why it went quiet and literally no one knew anything. And before me, James had been with um, another, you know, woman and married her for, you know, like 10 years. They were together right after the incident of, of David going missing. And once I went public with all of that, the ex-mother-in-law actually reached out to me and said she had no idea that this had even happened. That, and again, this is a very, very small town. And so, again, James is like, no, that's not true. You know, I told her and, you know, but literally when the page went up and the information started coming out, again, all of the documentation that has followed has been people from Pryor, Locust Grove, that entire area saying, when did this happen? Who is this child? Why did we never hear about this? Um, and so that follow-up just didn't exist. Wow. Hmm. And so we were lucky enough to have um, some private investigators who offered their services and who were a part of another missing page out of Oklahoma who wanted to assist. Well, you know, they just started, you know, obtaining information as best as they could, you know, trying to find school records, the actual police report, um, you know, just anything that they could gather that had to do with the case. They also reached out to Brenda. Um, they followed Brenda, I guess that's, you know, part of what they, they do, um, to the point to where Brenda tried to have them arrested. She felt they were, I guess, imposing on her, her privacy or, you know, digging too deep into the situation, but she literally tried to have them arrested to where they were like, we can't, we can no longer assist, at least on that piece. And so, um, you know, for years we kept in contact with um, the person who was in charge of this Oklahoma missing um, site on Facebook. And, you know, just all the back and forth of like any new updates, any new information. And, I mean, they were able to uncover a very vital piece of information that nobody else had. Um, and to this day, I think is a very, very key piece. But again, the amount of time, I just think the authorities do not know maybe what direction to even head. But they were able to obtain some of the records from the school. And the school had, you know, since David went missing, the school had burned down and a lot of the information had been lost. But what they were able to determine was that, again, this is April. When August came around, Brenda had told the school that David had moved. What the not heck? that he was missing, not that he was runaway, but he had moved. Did she provide where he moved Good to? God almighty. No. They just oh he moved. Yep. And again, lack of the school following through. We're talking, you know, technology wasn't the way that it is now to where you have to have your child enrolled, you have to have, you know, proof and all this documentation, you know, they can't just disappear one day and then never enroll in school ever again. Oh, man. Right. It doesn't work like that now. But so, you know, the the private investigators were like, this this doesn't make sense. Why would she say that? Why and I have no answers. I I 
I literally, it doesn't make sense. But I can't, I don't know why. But that was a key piece of information that they were able to gather. And, of course, when brought to, you know, myself and James, and then James, you know, spoke to his mother, she denied it. She denied that that ever, ever happened. Mm -hmm. And so, again, being the amount of time that had gone by, I don't, I truly don't know. You'd mentioned, but, you'd mentioned when you and I spoke that his social security number had been used after he went missing. Yes. Can you say any more about that? Um, I can only speak for what I know to be, you know, the truth of what was revealed. Okay. Um, they looked into, because I guess, you know, as technology is advanced, that's one of the most common things that they do um, when this amount of time has lapsed, you know, went by. They were able to determine that his Social Security number had been used. And based on the information that was provided, it was used by his mother. And oh. so that, again, I have no, I can't speak on as to what, as to why. I mean, that makes no sense. Do you think maybe she was drawing some benefits off of him or something? Well, or I mean, they are native. Yeah. Um, and so they are registered, you know, and are able to, you know, get those types of things. But the type of benefits that I believe, you know, the Creek and the Cherokee um, Nation provides is not something like um, money every month or something like that. Um, so I don't know what kind of benefit she would have gotten if she had continued that, um, you know, for the, the native part of it. Because, again, they, they don't provide any money. It's not like some, you know, tribes do that. Mm -hmm. But these particular ones do not. Again, they do have, like, housing and they have, you know, food commodities and things like that. And then school is something like furthering education. But an actual, you know, dollar bills being received, that's not something that these particular tribes do. Okay. So how did David get his information on some of these websites, like the Indian Affairs website, Charlie Project, and some of these others? How did that go about? Um, myself. Um, and then once it really took off, others would reach out and say, hey, can we put this on here? Or um, the lady that was helping from the Oklahoma Missing site was like, I'm going to pass this information along. Um, and, you know, she had other people in her network that she was able to help get some of that stuff out there. But the original page, which is the one that you contacted me on, um, was the very, very first to ever come out. And it was a very big deal. It, it played into the downfall of my marriage, which totally okay. Um, that's, again, I, you know, I've come to terms with that and said, if all I did was give David a voice, then that's all that matters. But at first, Brenda was accepting of this, of the page being made. Um, if you go back far enough on this page, you even see Brenda commenting about how she's grateful and that, you know, all these things and the wonderful wife and she speaks highly of me and, you know, she appreciates all this. And then as more information started to come out, more digging, um, she was done. She wanted the page shut down. And so instead, I offered to give them full control of this page, not only when I was married, but after we divorced. And it's been two years since in June. It will be two years. Um, and so I offered. I offered. And no, we'll make our own page. Okay. Well, I don't know what I did 
to really, besides, like I said, I kept digging and I kept fighting for those answers because it didn't make sense. And so she distanced herself from that page and then now there is one other page that she helps to, I guess, run or oversee. And they have reached out to me. Um, it's been a few years now, but they were like, why don't you take this down? Why don't you shut this down? And I'm like, why? Like, it doesn't have anything. There's nothing bad on here. There's, there's absolutely no reason. Like, if my child was missing or someone I knew, you take all the help you can get. Exactly. Yeah, it's, you, it's like you I almost don't want to find him. It's weird. Yes. It blows my mind. Somebody with children. I mean, it's just crazy to me. Yes. And again, the proof is on the page of the of her being accepting in the very beginning and being so grateful and, you know, wanting to find David and introduce him to, you know, myself and all of these things. And then, you know, those investigators became involved she tried to have them arrested then she wanted the page shut down and i just felt like it had you know nothing but genuine safe content that that was unnecessary so i offered to give them full control like i only you know i got us this far here you go like do as you please with it but no do not take it down and make it like it's just disappear again. Hmm. And so luckily, that's when, you know, as time went on, he's been added to all of this, you know, databases and missing sites, and it's not going to go away. No, it's, it's not going anywhere. Gonna, yeah, it's never going to go away. Mm -mm. And uh, like I said, I tell myself, if that was the purpose of meeting this family, you know, of everything that, you know, played out, then it's worth it. It's worth it because he was a child. And if nobody stood up for him or, you know, really searched and pushed and fought to find him, then what does that say? And so I, I knew I had to do something. And again, I asked, you know, my ex-husband, I'm like, is this okay? You know, like, we've got to do this. And at first, you know, he was like, I don't know if my family is really going to be happy. And, you know, and that's when he reached out to Brenda and she was okay with it. She gave her blessing. Yes. And again, the proof is on the page. Uh -huh. And, and then again when all of the the dirt started to fly she no longer you know she despised me i had threats um from multiple different people his sisters the mother um from the investigators telling me that i needed to be careful with the information and the things that i was uncovering um for my own safety and I always thought, well, I live in another state, you know, Oklahoma and Kansas touch, and that is where I reside. And so I thought, well, I guess if it's that, you know, big of a deal, come find me. You know, like, I really never had bad intentions, you know, that's not, that was not the purpose. I really thought that I was helping the family, helping James to have that closure because, James has struggled. Um, James is still struggling um, to come to terms with what happened in his childhood and around that. And I just wanted to be, you know, that nurturing, caring, loving spouse who's like, let me help you. And I knew that I could, you know, do some digging. And with all my background, I could at least put forth that effort. Because from what I was able to determine, no effort even went into this. No, from nobody, from, mm -hmm. my, from my point of view. And that was the worst part to me. Yeah. And so whenever, you know, all of that first started coming out, Brenda did have some, um, she, she, 
I don't know if she, again, remembers things differently or time had gone by. And she remembered him being older. She said he was 16. Hmm. And so I'm like, well, you know, my ex-husband is obviously a very hard drinker. And, you know, he's known to, you know, say things. But he's like, no, if I had been that age and he was 16, I would have no longer lived in the home. I would have already moved out and been married. And so he's like, there's no absolute way he was 16 years old. And again, you know, she fought with me on that about, like, that's not correct. But then as the the information came out, he was not. Hmm. And so some of those small details, again, I don't know how you could forget how old your child was when they went missing. But again, that was, you know, one of those things that James saw it differently versus how his mother saw it. But when the truth came out... James was correct. And, they, oh, go ahead. I'm, I'll, I'll leave you now. Go ahead. No, that's that's okay. I'm just saying that, you know, James hasn't provide, had not provided me information that ended up not being accurate. You know, and again, as your spouse, they aren't trying to deceive you. They're, you know, he was disclosing information to me and in hopes that it would help. And so, again... He was not 16 years old. Hmm. Do the authorities talk to any of the family members now, or, or are they investigating anything at all? Um, I know that some piece of property has had been searched. They had dug there, um, and that was a few years back. Um, James had let me know that. I had spoken to James um, in December of, of just the past December, so, you know, four months, three months ago, um, and asked him because, you know, it's still on my mind. It's still on my mind. And I asked him, have you provided DNA? And, you know, he's like, God, don't you ever stop? And I'm like, no, no. Hmm. Have you provided DNA? And he said, no. And I said, well, what about your sisters? I don't think so. And I was like, what about your mom? And he's like, well, my mom says that she has. And mm. I'm like, you realize that if there are missing or, you know, individuals who are found, there are lots of John Doe's, that they are able to, you know, with technology, run that against, you know, family's DNA and then can find matches of, you know, people who've gone missing and then have been unidentified for several years. And so he's like, no, no one's ever reached out to me. No, my mom says she has. But again, there's nothing to show that any matches have ever acquired against the family or if... Hmm anything has transpired on that um they did the tulsa which is the closest large city to um locust grove in prior oklahoma did um come and do like a interview for the family um where they you know provided um brenda and the sisters and james the opportunity to let you know the world know what you know, had happened. And again, photos of when David was little were put out there. You know, she told the story. Um, but that was that was the extent of it. Hmm. Um, there has been, you know, again, she's made a page of her own since um, that she assists with. Um, and the OSBI um, did interview James, and that was when I was still married to him back in 2018, 2019. Um, I know of two separate times that because, again, we lived in Kansas, and so I would drive, you know, be the one to take him to Oklahoma um, and then, you know, let him do what he needed to do and then be right there, you know, when the interviews and things were over. Um, but since then, I know... James has never been spoken to again about it. 
Um, and so I don't know what the OSBI does or, you know, the Locust Grove Police Department, those types of things. But I know of a search, but it came up empty at a piece of property that was in Locust. And how I came to know that information, um, James has since remarried, and, you know, his, his new wife and me, we've spoken, and, she, you know, she's a nice person, and she let me know, because she's always, you know, heard these things when she came into the picture of, you know, this horrible ex-wife who, you know, went uncovering all the family secrets or, you know, whatever it should be, and so she always kind of had that curiosity herself. And so she passed that information along to me. And so when I did speak with James um, back in December, I asked him about it. And he said, yeah, but nothing happened. Like, there was nothing. Wow. And so it's just as if, again, it just doesn't exist. If the authorities would reach out to a family member, who would that be? Would that be James or would it be David's mom, Brenda? Or who would they, um, who would they reach out to? The person that they, you know, have spoken with and done the majority of the speaking with has been Brenda. Um, and um, in the beginning, when it first started, there was an OSBI agent who, again, has a, a very well-known name for himself. He is, you know, the pride and joy of the OSBI in, in Oklahoma in his in his area. Is there some sarcasm going on there? <laughs> um, well, I mean, he may do his job very well, but again, this is one of those particular areas in which the investigators were like, you need to be careful. Okay. Um, because I was able to determine that this particular OSBI agent who... Um, Heather Terrell states is still the head of the case, which again, I didn't know, but I figured. He's, his wife is an actual crap tree. And so when that first came out, again, this is, you know, an agent that's very well respected, you know, well known, again, you know, has a high, you know, solve rate and all these things. And so I went above and went and called Oklahoma City and tried to pass that information along. And I was pretty much laughed at and told to keep my nose out of it, mind my business, and stay in my lane, pretty much. Wow. And, and to this day, I, I didn't know he's still the head of the case. And, I mean, there's no denying, there's no hiding it. His wife is family. And so that right there in itself, I don't care what agency you work for or what state you're in, that should be a conflict. Absolutely. That's, that, that's just not something that should be allowed. But because I am who I was and Brenda, you know, when all that started coming out, she wasn't happy and she pretty much told the OSBI not to speak to me. I was not a, around at the time of the disappearance that anything that I had to say or could bring to the case was completely irrelevant and she wanted me to, for them to have nothing to do with me. And I let it be. I let it be, but to this day, I hold a file in my file cabinet that has addresses, phone numbers, um, arrest records of, again, the individual that David was with that night, um, the, the crimes that he's committed since, the, the other brother, you know, the one that was closer in age to David. Um, I have so much information that I have not, I, I can't throw it away. I spent time, you know, making sure that the evidence that I had was factual, that it wasn't just hearsay or something that, you know, I heard along the way or made up. 
I made sure. And so to this day, I still have that information. And never, not one time, has anyone ever tried to speak to me. What the heck? Not one time. Not one time. And so, yes, when I heard that Heather was having the amount of pushback from authorities in Oklahoma, and then she said his name, I knew that there's still no resolution. This will not be resolved because if a family, even if they did have something to do with it, and then you put a, like I said, a very well-seasoned, very well-respected, highly regarded OSBI agent in into it, and his wife is family, there's going to be, I mean, again, not necessarily a cover-up to save face for myself. I can't, you know, go against the OSBI, but whatever. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't, he should not be in charge, period. No, it should be somebody totally different, somebody not even related at all. Exactly. And he's, he, he resides right there in the town. What the heck? And, again, it's none of it is private information. None of it's hidden. I mean, it's that simple that all you have to do is look into that information and automatically know that his wife is related. And right there, that should be enough. But, like I said, I, I put myself out there and I tried to you know, reach the actual OSBI headquarters and all this, and they were like, lady, what are you doing? Like, why? And I'm like, this isn't right. And again, whenever the the investigators, the you know, got involved in the Oklahoma um, missing page, those ladies were like, you need to be careful. You need to be careful because... You have a life. You have kids. You've worked hard to get to where you are, and you're playing with fire by trying to go above these people. And so, again, if she really used his social security number or received any type of benefits for X amount of years, um, that would probably explain why there's been no further, you know, investigation on that part. Nothing that could lead to her being arrested or having charges brought, you know, to her because it's family. Man. It's family. I mean, that's nothing and, but that's nothing but identity theft right there. I mean, at least. Yeah. And again, I don't know if the way the world works, they say, well, if the child's a minor and that's their parent, then maybe the parent can use the child's social. Uh, I don't know. Mm. I, that is something I can't, I can't speak on, but it doesn't make sense. No, 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 no. And so I, I just, I felt for Heather when I heard that and I, you know, I had let you know, I was like, well, that may may explain why this case isn't really progressing. And because when you live in a small town and it's all about who you know or who you're related to, and some things, I guess, are just easier laid to rest as if they don't exist. But he was a child. He was a person who needed a voice. Yeah. Who still does. Still does, yeah. You know, and that is why I refused to delete the page. Even, like I said, even if I let it go to her, to Brenda herself, the sisters, to James and his wife, I didn't care. But there was no way I was going to allow it to be deleted. Hmm. I'm blown away. How can our listeners help in this? What can they do? I know we're going to share this in your Facebook page on our socials, and what else can our listeners do? 
if they have, you know, have anything, whether they are able to think that they saw him, you know, 20, almost 24 years ago, you know, like on that particular night, if they think it was him or, you know, they know it was and they seen him with someone else, any detail at this point could be that missing piece because kids don't just vanish. Provide that. You know, it can be done anonymously. It can be done on any of the the Crabtree's pages. It can be done by calling authorities, not only in Prior, Oklahoma, which is Mays County. Um, it could be Locust Grove. It could be Tahlequah. It doesn't matter. Just if they saw something or if along the way over the years they've heard something. Or, again, if it's... You know, they feel that it's just not related, that somebody said they did something along the way years ago, and they have that gut feeling that, hey, that information doesn't set right. Pass it along. Again, they can report it on any of the national sites, um, the missing sites for children, for people in general who, you know, have been missing. There's so many outlets that the information can be provided and they can remain anonymous. Yeah, or anybody that knew David back then that played uh, uh, sports with him, that wrestled with him, or coaches, or anybody that knew him. Right around that time. Yeah, around that time, yeah. Yes, any anything. And again, they there was teammates. Then there's other kids who were in that alternative. And that's one of the things that James, you know, he still says to this day he has regret because he didn't know the names of these kids. He couldn't go, you know, to their houses and speak to them, and he didn't know who all David had started to interact with. And so, again, there were more kids there in that alternative setting. And, again, if they remember something or, again, if it's, yeah, he moved, and, and you know, where were they told that he moved? Where... Any key piece of evidence that they could feel, any little piece. And again, anyone can remain anonymous with the information. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Man. I know I told Dale about this, and uh, I said, well, we've got a, we've got another case that's going to piss you off, and this is going to do it. So. Yeah, and I'm smoking over here. Yeah, he, I see him smoking across the table. <laughs> it just drives me crazy that it took 14 years for anybody to do anything, and then finally, okay, it's great, but as soon as you got the shovel out and moved a little dirt around, everybody starts getting pissed off and wanting you to quit looking. And like, It's not like you lost a, a damn toy or something. This is a, a kid. It's yeah. <laughs> Why does it, it just, it's like nobody cares, like it doesn't matter to anybody but you, and that's driving me nuts. And I, again, was just an outsider who was able to look at missing sites and just see that David's not on there. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Because James just always assumed that his mother had went through with all of those things, and that, you know, it is what it is, and I was able to see no, he's on nothing yeah. at all. Yeah, I know. We, tried know to, we tried to look into it. We couldn't find anything. Yeah, we was like, oh, we need to check into this and look back. And it's like there's hardly any podcast, if any, and then only like two or three little YouTube things. And other than that, there's nothing. And this just doesn't make any sense. And, again, there's a lot of information, you know, that that the family holds that there's, you know, a lot of, back and forth as to whether or not the information is even relevant but you know it it had come out that uh david was not um the biological child of james crabtree senior and you know james feels that that may have played in to a lot of the behaviors that david started displaying mm. um and I, myself, reached out to the Bio family um, shortly after David went missing. Um, the biological father actually died in mm. um, his home at, you know, I guess a wife or ex-wife's um, hands. And so, again, I reached out to them and they said they hadn't seen um, David since he was two or three years old. 
and that they never saw him ever again, and and that was it. Like, they literally couldn't provide any additional information at all. Hmm. Wow. And so that, you know, is one of those things where, you know, a lot of, you know, things have gone on and people say, well, was he in that home with the, when the dad was murdered? Well, I'm sure that authorities searched, you know, the home, um, which was on the, the Kenwood uh, reservation that is in another small town, Salina, right there by Locust Grove, Tahlequah, Pryor, all these small little towns. And, um, you know, nobody had any reason to even think that David went to, yeah. the, to his bio dad. Um, but, you know, that had just, that information had just come to light in, you know, those, in that short period of time prior to him going missing, when all these behaviors really started to come out. Mm, okay. And so, again, that's, you know, there's not much on on the bio dad um, other than, yeah, you can, you know, look up records of, of you know, him being deceased and so forth and um you know and there's again so much information that has come out you know like such heather says you know she reached out to me um i believe last summer i'd have to you know look at the exact date but um and she said you know in no way am i trying to um you know make anything hard for you but I want to say it's possible that I, I seen him, you know, and I was like, well, what makes you think that, you know, and she provided information and, um, you know, the scar and how she thought he looked so similar to a friend of hers. And so I tried to assist her because she was like, I could use, you know, some help. No one will listen to me. Who do I turn to? And so I had reached out to the authorities where she lived. And they read my messages and just never, ever, ever responded. Man. So so what do you think about what she thinks? You think that's possible? Um, I, I definitely think that something occurred. Um, you know, I, I've read the comments and seen, you know, how people can question the info. But I feel like she's very detailed in what she remembers. And, again, I have all of those messages that she provided. And, yes, she, she trust me, provided plenty of details. And, you know, everything that she provided then was the same that she provided on the podcast. Her stories never changed. Um, you know, in her saying, I'm sorry that, you know, I think that he was dead already. And, you know, all of that information, she's never changed. Mm. And... So something definitely happened. Now, whether or not it was David or, you know, the other little girl that went missing, that's, that's the part where obviously she has that guilt because she feels like she should have done something. But I believe her. I believe that, you know, something took place. And when she provided me the names of the individuals that she thought was responsible, I immediately went and started researching the information. And he was, um, Terrell was known for being in that area um, and for doing construction and all these types of things that, um, because Locust Grove is off of a major um, highway, like literally that's it just sets right there and so there's a lot of traffic you know it may not be right there in the town but it's very accessible hmm. and where if you wanted to you know hitchhike or go out there and try to find a ride at a truck stop that wouldn't be an issue and so it's totally possible Again, I know that you looked at the distance between the locations in which um, she had the incident occur and where David went missing, and it's not that long of a drive. It's, it's, it's completely possible, you know, but I don't know. Right. And, but she was so adamant that 
his facial structures and the fact that she remembered his, you know, how his eyebrows looked because he does have some very definitive features that, um, you know, again, the police that night thought that he was older. Um, so obviously he, you know, he had a face that has stayed in her mind and the fact that she kept on trying to find him trying to search and see who was this kid that, you know, she may have seen, but she could never find it because it was never there to find. Right. And then she just, you know, obviously, the I don't know if it's the guilt or that worry that she was like, she kept searching. She didn't give up. And then one day it appeared. And then, you know, she she had told me at the time she was like i don't know about the dates like what what days was this you know like and i explained that to her and then obviously as time has gone on she's been able to pinpoint exactly when it was due to you know a deceased family member on her husband's side the boy across the street and that's how they know for a fact that's the date right yeah and the fact that the boy, he recalls the same information, or, you know, he's a man now, but he recalls that same information. Um, And again, I don't know what, um, like she said, she doesn't want clout or, you know, for the world to know who she is, Um, just like myself. That's in no way. Um, It's all about what can we do to help. And, you know, in her case, she still, she has nightmares. She can't, you know, sleep. Her life, it's consumed her. Yes. Um, and so, in my mind, in my opinion, she's telling the truth. Now, whether or not we know if it's truly those children, we will never know. Right. But something but, definitely happened. Yes, yes, yes. You know, she, her information has been consistent the entire time. Yeah. And it's, again, what would have what would be the reason for, you know, reaching out to to myself or to David's page and just asking, "Can you help me? I think I may have this information." Not, you know, saying she was 100% sure and that you better listen to her. No, she she needed that help and that reassurance and that's why I told her I said I understand I will do what I can to help you because obviously you're struggling and you know I will do what I can and so at that time you know I I immediately went and said hey this person may have this information that pertains to this and you can see obviously on Facebook when they see or read your message and never no response this day. That blows my mind. And so, you know, she fought for a while trying to have somebody just listen to her. And, you know, again, whether or not it's those kids, something still happened. And there was still, obviously, a deceased younger, you know, male in that vehicle and a small, younger girl that obviously was not, you know, relationship to the wife and and Terrell, obviously. Um, She was scared for her life, so they obviously are someone's children. Yep. These are somebody. And, again, it's just all about who do we get the right information to and who's going to listen and how can we help to, you know, bring closure and I know, you know, again, something obviously did happen, but can we be certain if it was them? I'll never know. And I believe, obviously, if, you know, Carol could answer that. But, again, that's not my my area. That's for authorities, you know, that, right. or that's what you hope is that they go and say, hey, where were you at this time? What kind of car, you know? All they got to do is it's it's not that complicated to piece together what kind of car did he drive at that time. Yeah, ask some questions. I mean, hell, he's sitting right there. It ain't like you got to find him. Exactly, and that's all. It, that's that's it. 
but again, a lot of cold cases, they're forgotten. Yeah. Insane. And, you know, the system is overwhelmed with current things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a lot of these just are forgotten. And that's the sad yeah. reality for, for these types of cases. Well, Shannon, you got any more or any last words you want to say about David Crabtree before we close out? Um, again, I will never, um, you know, stop hoping and praying that, again, even if he's sat there unidentified for all these years, that at some point he will have the peace that he deserves. Um, you know, and know that even though I was not there when it happened, I'm not, you know, family, um, that I was his voice, that I tried, that I, no matter what, he needed that, and I was willing to do that for him, and that's all that matters. And you should be champion for that because, I mean, yeah. you put in a lot of work, and it's really impressive that you would step up and take on this challenge and never let it go. Yep, and again, at any time, if anyone ever hears this and I got that file. I got them messages, those phone numbers, those addresses, those. I got that stuff. Yeah. It's just, it, it, it is honestly crazy to me that no one has ever, you know, spoken to me. Because what if I do have a missing piece right. of something that could potentially be that missing piece of the puzzle? Maybe that's why they haven't. Seems like the way everybody's acting. They've been scared they might find something. And that's, that's the sad reality, but, yeah. you know, if that's the case, then let it be. Let, let David have his closure and be able to know that somebody fought for him. Yes. That somebody cared. And, you know, something that has gone through my mind as a parent, as, you know, the, an outsider per se in this, if he went missing as like a runaway... And then he saw no effort being put into looking for him or what he felt like was no effort. He, he didn't see, you know, all of his face on, you know, flyers and in the paper and on the news. Maybe, you know, that's why he didn't feel He's like, like cared. anyone cared. Right. I feel you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. but like, so what the again, hell, why should I go back? Nobody cared if I leave and left. But again, that's just, you know, huh. my personal thing on that because you would hope by now and at that age, people just don't disappear, even though they do. It, it's very unfortunate, but somebody has to know something. Yeah. Something more has to come of this and... I just hope that in the end, there are answers for James, for his sisters, um, for the family that actually, you know, invested their time, which, again, is, is very minimal, but that they get those answers and that David gets closure, that he has that peace brought to him, as well as Heather and the little girl in that case, you know, I really just hope that authorities put forth that effort with those simple questions, you know, and try to see if maybe it was, and if it is, then it will allow that little girl to have her peace as well. Yep. That little girl belongs to us here. That missing girls in our county. So that's why we really focused on her quite a bit. And then Heather had reached out to us and we got to looking into David Crabtree and it's just sort of It's sad all way around. It is, it really is. Yeah, and and again, the fact that the information is still so small yeah. and there's just not a lot. It's it is sad. And well, so I do appreciate um, you guys reaching out to me and allowing me to provide what information I do have um, about David and about his family. And, you know, again, I do my best to only provide 
things that I knew to be factual and um, that, you know, I could say, hey, I have this document to prove this or to back this up. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that when, you know, if anything was ever said and done, I knew that I'm only doing what's the right thing, not trying to, you know, bring, you know, angry people to the family and make things worse for them. Those were never my intentions, no. ever. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. We certainly appreciate everything you've done in, as far as digging and finding out stuff because, you know, there's nothing out there. So, yeah, you're the voice, definitely the voice of David Crabtree, no doubt. It's all worth it for me in the end, and I just hope that, you know, someday – there will be that resolution and not for, it's not for me it's for him yes you yeah. know just knowing that even one person or just a, a small handful of people you know care enough to still fight and pursue some answers it's worth it you know and again like I had told my ex-husband if that's the only reason I met you and the only reason I was married to you then I'll take it. Absolutely. Yes, for sure. All right, Shannon, we appreciate you so much. We appreciate you talking to us. Hey, this is this is awesome. Yeah. We'll get this out. And, and if there's anything else we can do right down the line, please reach out that we can help. Yes. I appreciate that, and I know that um, James appreciates it as well. Absolutely. All right, well, Shannon, I hope you have a good night. And, again, we thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, Dale, again, we want to thank shannon cavender yeah man what a what a story yeah and the girl has done her research she man she has busted her ass i'm trying to get stuff yeah done. and she don't even have a dog in the fight no yeah it, it just blows my mind it's so sad and if, i just don't understand it. if anybody is an authority that's listening to this and you can help check shannon and her information and see what she has you might have something that could tie some of this stuff together it can Find out what happened to David Crabtree. Hell, at least just see if she's got something you don't. Yeah. She's been working her butt off. Yeah. Cataloging and keeping everything. She has talked to people. Lots. Yeah, and she probably talked to people that they haven't talked to. Yeah, I'm very impressed. But that, that was good. I, mean, I hope we can help some way get the word out on David Crabtree. Yes. Well, it needs to be out because there's nothing out there. So hopefully this is a, a good start. Yep. All right, dude. We're going to get out of here, man. Okay, let's roll. We want everyone to be safe. Please be careful and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is The, the Crack, Crack House, House Chronicles. Chronicles.